we look to the 24th chapter of Luke for our opening sentence. When Jesus speaks, our hearts burn within us. Our eyes are opened when he breaks the bread. Teach us to love one another with that passion which comes from your overflowing heart, vine grower, so those around us will recognize us as sisters and brothers, bound together by your love, not divided by our fears. Teach us to serve one another with that compassion which comes from our broken heart, vine of our lives. For the hungry are our brothers, the immigrants are our sisters, the homeless are our families. Teach us to include others with that embracing welcome which comes from your inviting heart, fruit-bearing spirit, offering forgiveness to those who hurt us, peace to all filled with hate, hope to those burdened by despair. Teach us to understand all we read and hear as we worship this day. Amen. In the call to reconciliation, we say, the seeds of grace, hope, joy, and love are planted deep within us so they can bear fruit in our lives. But we resist staying connected to the vine, thinking we can flourish on our own. Let us confess our sins so we can once more feel God abiding deep within us. Please join me as we pray, saying, Mother of compassion, called to be one body, refragment ourselves into a million selfish pieces. Your children of love, we insist on the right to despise our sisters and brothers, though your perfect love was broken for us. We are afraid to give ourselves to the world. Abide in us, vine grower. Forgive us of our sins so we may live boldly love fearlessly, and proclaim unceasingly that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. In the prayer for illumination, living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit, so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading for today comes from 1 John chapter 4 beginning with verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, 
but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading comes from the first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Listen for the word of the Lord. 
Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this. We may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The command we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join your hearts with me in prayer? Holy One, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's about love, love, love. Anyone hear the Beatles singing in the background? The religions of the world, the religion of Jesus, the religion about Jesus, love. It's about love. That's what it's all about, isn't it? If you take the fundamental ideas of the five biggies, the best of Christianity, the best of Islam, the best of Buddhism, the best of Hinduism and the best of Judaism, and you take all these great religions of the world and put them into a pot and bring that pot to a boil, and you let them boil down to their fundamental essence, the sludge at the bottom of the pot, what do you get? Love. Good old Walter Rauschenbusch at the early part of the 20th century with this social gospel movement, talked about boiling Christianity down to two simple statements, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. A little bit dated language, but we get what he was talking about. It is, and this is a very big, more or less, the concept of love God and love one another. And as the slightly more modern scholar Diane Eck tells us, compassion 
that common feature again of so many ways that we approach the divine throughout God's whole world. Love in action. God is love, writes John. And then he goes on to say, a person who loves lives in God. That person who loves is born of God. That is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us. Such an important distinction. And so hard for us, I think, as human beings to just let that be, to receive the creator of the universe and everything in it, just loving us, period. Mic drop. God loves us. Love. Now, I know that we can twist those words, and they have been twisted to say, love is God. Love is God. Not God is love, but love is God. And that's happened over time. I'm sure you've met a lot of people who believe that this distortion that uh, God who is love becomes love is God. You may have heard of the Gnostics back from John's time. That's kind of who he was trying to fight against. Those who believed that you had to have this special gnosis, this knowledge to be saved. And I know we don't like to talk about heresy unless, of course, it's people calling us heretics. But we, as modern day Christians, hear a lot about people talking about love. We like, in fact, to worship the principles of love. I hear that sometimes, the ethics of love, that love is God. And maybe even instead of Christianity, we start to believe in loveyanity. John liked to say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Relax, John would say, in to that love God has for you. Trust in it. That's salvation. Fall into it. The Gnostics, on the other hand, would say, no, love is the way, love is the truth, love is the life. I'm sure you've heard modern day folks say just the same thing. It's not really important to believe that Jesus was the son of God. I mean, how weird is that really? But more important is to say Jesus was the greatest human being who ever lived because he embodied love. The symbol who points to something greater and Jesus becomes the symbol of greater reality, love. So John, way back then, knowing there were people who were saying that love is God and love is the way and the truth and the life gives us two commandments. The first being this, to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the flesh. And the second, love one another as I have loved you. Love in action. Well, why did John do the first? Well, today, just like back then, a lot of very reasonable people find it a lot easier to believe in love than in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. To believe in the principle of love makes more sense. In this post-modern post age, whatever we want to call it now, it is somewhat uncomfortable to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Jesus Christ as my Lord and my God, my goodness. It is easier to confess 
that God is love, that love is God, and whoever lives in love lives in God. That's not too offensive, right? You won't offend anybody by saying that love is the way to go. Such statements are palatable, reasonable, and acceptable. Love Hanity has its attractions. It's so much easier just to leave it at that. Just stop there. Not get so focused on this person, Jesus Christ, who had a mom, who had an adoptive father, if you believe those stories, who had brothers and sisters, who had friends, who ate fish and walked on water, that Jesus Christ. But John says, no, first believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then love one another. Well, now we know why the second commandment of love is so important. Well, you know already why it's so important. That's why there are so many songs about it, for goodness sakes. You're probably already hearing the music. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Love is what makes the world go around. If we just had a little more love for each other, wouldn't things be a whole lot better? I recall the quotation, this is a slight paraphrase, by Tehar de Chardin, Chardin the uh, Roman Catholic philosopher. I know you French speakers are like, you're butchering his name, but this is the best I can do. When the human race finally harnesses the energy of love, it will be as if they discovered fire for the second time. So we understand the why of the second commandment and why harnessing love is so important. But why this thing about Jesus Christ? Why do we need to say, he's my Lord and Savior? So old fashioned. My goodness. But I need to ask you a question. Have you ever tried praying to love? Just sitting down or going for a walk. I'm a fan of the prayer walk. And just talking your personal problems over with the principle of love, the ethics of love. Have you ever brought your aches and pains to love? Have you cried out in the middle of the night when your heart was breaking apart? Did you call out to love? Have you ever wondered what happens when your child dies? Does the love principle watch you as you walk every step of every day? Does love watch as you sleep every breath of every night? Do you say, love, help me. Love, give me strength and wisdom for this problem. No, we say, Jesus, I need your help. My Lord, I need your strength and wisdom because we recognize we're not in charge. Finally, when we are in trouble, we ask God to work through our humble, often miserable flesh, because when we pray, we don't pray to a concept. We don't even pray to compassion. We sometimes pray to God for compassion, but we pray to a person who has a name. You see, there's, there's something abstract about loveyanity. <laughs> but Christ, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, 
is a personal embodiment of a personal God. Remember that part about God loving you. <laughs> because Jesus was the Son of God in the flesh, the incarnation of God. God become human, born of a mom, a human woman. Why did God become the incarnation of love? I think because there's a difference between God made flesh and dwelt among us and the principle of love. Action, remember compassion is love made into action. There's a difference between hearing the story and living the story, between the immediate experience of life lived in flesh and blood, sweat and tears, friends who hug one another and stumble and catch each other when they fall, and a life removed. Stories are one thing, but life is another. Now, people told me plenty of stories before I became a parent. But I tell you, flesh and blood reality is not something the stories could prepare me for. That particular way, my heart broke one day just for no real reason just looking at my daughter her radiant smile her strength and her beauty and my fear for her and my hope and my joy pierced my heart like an arrow and i don't know what to do with love like that and no one telling me could prepare me for that. I remember that absolute desperate rock bottom fatigue of it being 2 a.m. and walking our baby son and rocking him and singing to him and trying to get him to sleep. Doing everything I could think of. We put him in what we call our baby space pod. It was a, a super duper awesome baby swing. And I just sat on the steps of our back porch and wept because I was so tired. But somehow I found a strength I did not know I had. It was like a power, a super extra gear of parenthood. that I didn't know I possessed. Jesus Christ was like that warm body of God who will walk with you and sing to you when you are beyond your own strength. God loved us so much. God came to earth to live and suffer like us and even die like us. God lost a child. For those of you who have been through that experience, God knows. That is love. God has lived in an imperfect, fallible, broken body just like yours. Talk about perfect love. Of course, we have no fear. In this time when we 
are surrounded and besieged and sometimes drowning in so many fears, we are faced with this perfect love. Casting our fears aside, coming to us in that warm embrace. Not a piece of paper on which ideas about love were written, but a warm body of God filled with love for you. He moved people like ideas alone could not. Now books have been written about love, poetry and dissertations, children's stories, musical scores, all about love. Yet nothing quite touches the reality of love like a person. We have that person in Jesus Christ, the Son of God in the flesh, who lived and died and returned from death so that we might learn love. He welcomes us to the table. And by his example, we learn to welcome others. Amen. Would you join your hearts with me in prayer? Merciful God, powerful and wonderful, eternally present and graciously close. We are grateful for what you have given us in Jesus Christ, life and love without end. Prompted by your spirit and encouraged by your faithfulness, we lift to you the cares and concerns of our hearts, the burdens and worries of our lives. We pray that the sick would be healed, that the broken would be mended, that the mournful would be comforted. We pray that the warriors would yield to peace, that leaders would gain wisdom, that the forsaken would be gathered in. We pray that the sorrowful would be consoled, that the poor would be lifted up, and that the anxious would be released. We pray for children in their growing and for youth in their seeking. We pray for those making new starts and for those nearing a journey's end. We pray for those facing hard choices and for those enduring painful consequences. We pray for those filled with bitterness and for those who are just empty. We pray that your church might claim its potential and that the body of Christ might be strengthened by its many parts, that the work of ministry might be done with joy and thanksgiving. We pray for the courage to follow Jesus, for the faith to trust your promises to us, for the vision to see your kingdom among us even now. We pray for all that you would have us pray. We pray for those for whom no one prays. We pray all these things in the name of the one ceaselessly praying for us, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Trusting in Christ, we offer together the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
we are invited as an act of worship to return to God the first fruits of that with which God has blessed us. You may uh, give in our online giving portal on Trinity's website or send checks uh, to our church office. You can give of your time and your talents in a variety of ways to this congregation and to God's world. Would you join your hearts with me in prayer? From you comes every gift we need, every blessing we have. May we not hoard them for ourselves, but offer them back to you, that the poor might be fed, the lonely befriended, and the despairing be filled with hope. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, blessed are you who hunger for righteousness, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who thirst for righteousness, for you will drink deeply of the cup of joy. Blessed are you who yearn for reconciliation, for you will find peace. Blessed are you who are persecuted in the name of religion, for yours is the commonwealth of heaven. Blessed are we, for Christ calls us to this table, where there is room for everyone and plenty for all. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Would you join your hearts with me in the great prayer of thanksgiving? May the God of searches be with you, and also with you. Bring your hearts to the one who loves you. We offer them so God may plant fruit-bearing seeds in them. Lift songs of praise to our God. We will join our hearts and voices in proclaiming God has done it. Get up, you cried to your word and spirit, and go down to the wilderness road to chaos. And so they went, calling forth life out of nothing, planting seeds that branched into vines, pouring clear water into earth's hollows, crafting us in your imaginative image. You showed all of this to us with delight in your heart, but we did not understand what we were seeing and so chose death and sin to be our guides in this life. Though we loved you last, you loved us first, sending your prophets to declare all you had done but we continued to abide in the tangled briars of temptation. So you sent Jesus to us, the one who would bear your fruit of salvation and hope for all your children. With those who seem to intuit your hearts, with those seeking to understand your hopes, we lift our songs of thanksgiving to you. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of eunuchs and evangelists. All creation bears fruit in glorifying you. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes to abide in us. Hosanna in the highest. Love is your language of holiness, branch weaving God. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, is the true vine of your heart. When we were wandering, lost and alone, trying to understand what we were doing, he crossed over glory to join us in this journey we know as life. When we could do nothing to prevent our bondage to sin, he came to set us free. When we could not learn how to make things right with you, he went down the wilderness road into the cold tomb of death. So, as you raised him to new life, he might proclaim to us 
God has done it. As we seek to abide in Jesus, as we long to bear fruit in the kingdom, we speak of the mystery known as faith. Christ died that we might live through him. Christ was raised that he might live through you. Christ will come that all might live through eternity with you. Abide in us at this table. As you pour out your spirit on the gifts of the bread and cup and on your children gathered in this place and all places. The broken bread reminds us that you loved us first so that as we eat of it, we might put the needs of the hungry, the searching, the hurting, the lonely before our own. The cup of grace nourishes us so we can go over and join the oppressed and outcasts, intertwining our branches with theirs so we all become part of the vine of justice and of hope. Then, when we no longer sleep in death, but are gathered around your table with our sisters and brothers of all times and places, we will join in singing with one voice and heart. You have done it. God in community, holy in one. Amen. <clears throat> On the night before he met his death, Jesus came to the table with those he loved. He took bread and he praised you, God of all creation. He broke the bread among his disciples and said, take this, all of you, eat of it all. This is my body given for you. When the supper was ended, he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to you, God of all creation. He passed the cup among his disciples and he said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin do this in remembrance of me friends at your own tables when we eat our bread and drink our cups we remember the saving death of our risen lord until he comes again in glory. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and eat. Please join your hearts with me in prayer. Here at this table, we celebrate resurrection as you feed us with bread and wine. And as much as we might prefer to stay here in this protected place, you send us back to our work. Only it is no longer the same work because we know you are with us and in us, shaping and transforming us to be your witnesses in the world. Nourished in body, mind, and spirit, may all that we say and do give you glory. Amen. Beloved children, may the love of the holy triune God 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit abide with you forever. Hallelujah. Now go forth in Jesus' name, remembering his new commandment to love one another. Shalom. Go in.